open our Bibles first of all this morning to Deuteronomy chapter 28. Then we'll get to Proverbs in a little bit. Deuteronomy chapter 28, and let's look at verse 2. And it shall come to pass, well, I started in verse 1. If you'd have been in the Spirit, you'd have known that. <laughs> let's go ahead and start with verse 1. And it shall come to pass, if thou shalt hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to observe and to do all his commandments which I command thee this day, that the Lord thy God will set thee on high above all nations of the earth. And all these blessings, say all these blessings. All these blessings. Look at your neighbor and say, all these blessings. All these blessings. And all these blessings shall come on thee and overtake thee, if thou shalt hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God. And then, of course, it lists all those blessings that he was referring to. The message translation says it this way. All these blessings will come down on you and spread out beyond you because you have responded to the voice of God, your God. And then the New International Version says, <clears throat> all these blessings will come on you and accompany you if you obey the Lord, your God. Did you notice these various descriptions of what the blessings will do. First of all, they will come on and overtake you. They will come down and spread out on you. They will come on and accompany you. And the word accompany implies to be present with you wherever you go and in whatever you do. I like the sound of that. How about you? Then the Good News Bible says, obey the Lord your God and all these blessings will be yours. Look at somebody and say, I intend to obey the Lord my God. And therefore, say it, and therefore, all those blessings will be mine. And I think you ought to thank God in advance. Praise God. Amen. Amen. Now, yesterday, uh, after returning from Branson, Missouri, I went down to spend the night at my river house on the Brazos River. And uh, I walked down to my dock to see if the river was still low or if it had risen any since the last time I got to go down there. And it had not. In fact, I think it was lower than the last time I was there. But I, I sat on the dock for a little while just enjoying the, the, the peace uh, and the, just, just watching the river flow. And suddenly I heard the Spirit of God say this, tomorrow meaning today, show the people how to get in the flow of God's blessings. Show the people how to get into the flow of God's blessings. Now, going back to me sitting on the dock and watching the river flow, I thought about this. The beginning of a river is called its source. Its source. Just like the uh, Lake Istica, way up in northern Minnesota, is the source of the Mississippi River. And you know the Mississippi flows from way up in northern Minnesota. I've ridden up there on the motorcycle before and saw where it all begins. And it flows all the way down to the Gulf of Mexico. Now, Vicksburg, Mississippi is where I was born. And uh, we used to spend a lot of time on the Mississippi River down there. And my grandfather always said to me, you've heard me say this before, but it's my sermon, I want to say it again. My grandfather always said to me, because we had, uh, when I was a kid, we had about 70 acres, and my grandfather planted a lot of it, and he always said that we were going to have good crops, good harvest. I said, Grandpa, you say that every year. How do you know we're going to have good crops? He said, son, this is good old Mississippi Delta soil. You see, all the minerals and nutrients and all of that that start way up in northern Minnesota, they wash down the river and they dump in what is called the delta. And you can grow anything in the delta. In fact, the delta was known as where cotton was king. So uh, the mouth of the river is called its source and then it flows. And so I thought about this. God is our source. He is the source. And just like 
a river, blessings flow down from him. Can you say amen to that? The blessings have a source, which is God himself. And from that source, they flow downward to us. That's why Proverbs chapter 10, verse six says this, blessings are upon the head of the just. They're upon the head of the just, meaning they flow down from God. Hallelujah. They come down from the source, which once again is God himself. James chapter one, verse 17 says, every good and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the father. I would say the blessings of God are good and perfect gifts, wouldn't you? Yes. Is anybody turning them down? If you don't want them, I'll take your portion, okay? No, they're good gifts, good and perfect gifts. The message translation says, every desirable and beneficial gift comes out of heaven. Every desirable and beneficial gift comes out of heaven. So once again, God is the source of the blessings and they come down from heaven. So uh, the message trans, uh, the Passion Translation says, they stream down from the Father. They stream down from the Father. That sounds like a flow, doesn't it? Yes. Amen. Now, one of the meanings of the word stream is flowing in abundance. Flowing in abundance. That's what God wants happening to you and me. That his blessings are flowing in abundance in our lives. Would anybody say amen to that? God's not interested in you being blessed occasionally. He wants you blessed all the time. He wants you extremely blessed. I like to say it this way. The Bible says we have a better covenant founded upon better promises than the people under the Old Testament. Well, under the Old Testament, Abraham was blessed and favored. Under the New Testament, Jerry is extremely blessed and highly favored. That's a better covenant. Amen. Look at your neighbor and say, and me too. So God wants his blessings flowing in our lives, not just occasionally, but a steady flow of his blessings. Now, I, I looked this up. The U.S. Geology, Geological Survey uses the term stream flow to refer to the amount of water flowing in a river. Stream flow is always changing and its main influence is the amount of rainfall that it experiences. Now, you remember a few weeks ago, we had a lot of rain. In fact, down at my river house, uh, the, the grass was dying. I mean, it was, you know, uh, it was brown, very few patches of green. It was, you know, when you walked on it, it, it uh, had a, a, a sound to it. <laughs> you know, anybody know what I'm talking about? And, uh, but after all that rain, I mean, it rained for several days and, and we got heavy rains. And after that rain, it was all green again. And the river was full. But after the rain stopped, the river went down again. And right now it's very low. I'm talking about the Brazos River. It's very low. So stream flow is always changing. And the main influence on a stream flow is the amount of rainfall that it's experiencing. Now, after reading this, I thought of this scripture, Ezekiel 34, verse 26. I will cause the shower to come down in his season. There shall be showers of blessing. Showers of blessing. That's a stream flow. Showers of blessing. And notice they will come down in its season. There are some seasons where we get very little rain. Some seasons, you know, like the springtime, where we get an abundance of rain. Amen. Amen. And I don't know, but I just feel like I'm in the springtime of the blessings of God. Amen. There's been a continual flow. I've had people ask me on several occasions over the last several months, Brother Jerry, why is it that some people seem to just enjoy the blessings all the time and then others, it's just once in a while? Well, I'll answer that in just a few moments. You may not like the answer, but I'm going to answer it. 
There's, there, there's some people that every time you see them, they're talking about another blessing that's come. Amen. Are you one of those? Yes. <laughs> well, you can be, praise God. I've had people say, you know, uh, somebody asked me not too long, Brother Jerry, uh, you and Brother Jesse and Brother Cope just seem to be blessed all the time. I said, thank you for noticing. Hallelujah. <laughs> Amen. But there's a reason for that. And it's not because we're preachers. I know lots of preachers that are not blessed all the time. Amen. Amen. They could be, they should be. Every believer should be blessed. Amen. Amen. We have, we have a covenant that guarantees blessings, but we have a part to play in it as well. Can you say amen? amen. Now, once again, James 1.17 says, every desirable and beneficial gift or blessing comes out of heaven. And the passion says, streaming down from the Father. So from time to time, there are showers of blessing. There are seasons where we experience a greater flow of blessings than perhaps at other times. But blessings should never cease. Yes. Amen. Amen. You know, I've had, I've had years where uh, God was blessing, but then there were other years where it was just overwhelming. I mean, every time we turned around, it was something major taking place. I remember way back in 1981, uh, going into 1981, we were under a severe attack financially. And uh, man, we were, just, we were just barely keeping our head above water. And uh, I was preaching with Brother Copeland in the uh, East Coast Believers Convention in Charlotte, North Carolina in the old Coliseum. And uh, nobody knew, because I don't talk about what I'm going through. I only talk about it after I've won and I have the victory. So, you know, uh, most of the time, people don't know what I'm going through, because once again, I don't talk it. I just stay focused, stay in faith, and wait for the victory, and then I give the testimony of it, praise God. In fact, I've had people say, we didn't know you were going through that. That's exactly what, right. I didn't want you to know what I was going through. Now, some people, on the other hand, oh, dear God, they will bend your ear. You know what I'm talking about? Telling you about all they've been through. How bad it is. Oh, dear God, if God doesn't intervene, we're going to lose everything. Well, I don't talk like that. So most of the time, no one knows what I'm going through because I just don't talk it. I just believe somehow, some way, I'm going to see the goodness of God. Yes. It's going to manifest yes. and it'll manifest right on time. Yes. Now, if I was God, I would make it happen sooner. <laughs> you know, but, but, you know, he, 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 he comes in right on time. Amen. And so in 1981, uh, in Charlotte, North Carolina, I'm preaching and having a great time preaching and, and, I, and, and, and I'd go to the pulpit and I had a lot of pressure on me with these financial situations, but they didn't know anything about it. I preached like I had every need met and had more than enough and was ready to distribute to everybody in the building. <laughs> Amen. But they didn't know what I was going through. And so on Thursday, after I got through preaching, Carol and I went to the hotel and, uh, uh, you know, there's like four services, four or five services a day. And by Thursday, you're tired. I've been preaching every day. And uh, so we got back to the room and Carolyn said, are you going to take a nap before we go to the service tonight? I said, no, uh, I'm just going to sit here in the living room and uh, just relax. And you'll go on in the bedroom. And she said, if I don't take a nap, I won't be able to keep my eyes open while Brother Copeland's preaching tonight. I said, well, go ahead and you go in and take a nap and I'll wake you up in time to get ready and go to the service. So she did, shut the door. And I, I took my suit off, hung it up, and I put on my robe. And I'm sitting on the sofa in this uh, room and I propped my feet up on the coffee table. 
And I put my hands behind my head and just leaned back on the sofa. And I closed my eyes for just a moment, not to sleep, but just closed my eyes for a moment. And suddenly the Shekinah glory of God filled the room. It got so thick, I couldn't even see the furniture anymore. And then Jesus appeared. And it's the first time it ever happened to me. Jesus appeared and he said this, my people are in financial famine and it's not my will. He said, and I'm going to reveal to you the keys to come out of financial famine and hold you responsible for teaching them everywhere I send you from this moment forward until I tell you otherwise. And so I grabbed this legal pad that was on the table next to the sofa and, and I started writing. I filled up that legal pad. It seemed like to me he was there for hours, but it was just moments, just moments, which led me to believe that Jesus can say more in moments than most preachers can in a lifetime. And then he left, but the glory was still there. Suddenly, and I, I'm just sitting there basking in it. And suddenly the bedroom door opened and Carolyn come walking through and she said, what's going on in here? And I said, I just had an appearance of the Lord, a supernatural appearance of the Lord. Now, most people, when they, when they, the first time I started sharing this story, most people would say at that point, what did he look like? Carolyn didn't say that. She said, what did he say? Amen. Now, what he looked like would have been, imp you know, important, but not as much as what he had to say. In fact, I can't tell you what he looked like because I was intrigued with what he was saying. But I knew he was there. Okay, and that, that was the first time that's happened to me, but it's not the last time it's happened to me. But this time, uh, she said, well, what did he say? I said, well, sit down. And, and the, the, the room was still full of glory. And she sat down next to me and I began to read to her what he said. She said, are you going to tell Brother Copeland about this? I said, no. She said, why not? I said, well, you know, we've worked together so long, he'll pick it up in the spirit. I don't have to tell him. So we went over to the service that night. And uh, we sat down on the front row, uh, Gloria and Carolyn and me and Charles and Peggy Caps and Norval Hayes were the speakers. And we're all sitting there on the front row and Brother Copeland got up and he sang a couple of songs. And then he got his Bible and his notebook, laid it on the podium and said, let's open our Bibles. And then he just stood there with his hands on the pulpit like this and didn't tell us where to open his Bibles, our Bibles. And he just looked at his, kind of doing like this with his thumbs. Then he tried again. Let's open our Bibles. He never told us. You know, inquiring minds want to know. <laughs> and finally he closed his and he said, Jerry, God visited you today. Come tell us what he said. <laughs> so I, I went up to the platform and as I walked by him, he had his associate to put a chair about this close to the pulpit. And as I walked by him, he grabbed my coattail and said, you tell us everything you said and you don't leave a word out. You understand me, boy? I said, yes, sir. And so I preached that night the sermon I entitled it, Sowing in Famine. Sowing in Famine. Because God said, I don't want my people in famine. That is contrary to the covenant that they have with me. And so I preached on sowing and famine from Genesis chapter 26. When I got through preaching, the Lord had impressed upon me before I left the hotel to sow in the Kenneth Copeland's ministry out of every major department of my ministry because I was in famine. I didn't have enough money to do anything that I knew God wanted me to do. And I had 10 departments of my ministry. The, the television department, the missions department, aviation department, publication department, and so on. And the Lord said, write a thousand dollar check out of every department of your ministry and put it in K 
Kenneth Copeland's hands and make it to his ministry. Now, 10 departments, so that would total $10,000. So I said, well, that doesn't sound like famine to me. Oh, it is when you need a hundred times that much. <laughs> That's famine. Amen. Amen. And in some of those departments, it was the last thousand dollars I had. And so I took 10 checks over there for $1,000 each and one check personal out of my personal account because Keller and I were getting ready to build the house that we live in today. Okay. And I sold a thousand dollars out of that account. Now I normally would have done that privately. I would have done it back in the speaker's room. But the Lord impressed upon me when I got through preaching, there was such an anointing in that service that he said, do it publicly. So I put $1,000 in each, out of each department into Brother Copeland's hand. And then the people began to follow suit. In fact, I was later told that night is one of the greatest uh, financial blessings of that ministry at that particular time. And then I left there and I went to Tulsa, Oklahoma to be with Kenneth Hagin. I'm sitting in the audience. Brother Hagin's preaching. He stopped and said, Brother Jerry, come up here. God's told me to do something. Now, Brother Hagin was not in those meetings in Charlotte. This is a week later. He said, Brother Jerry, God told me to do something. Come up here. I walked up there and on the way up there, he said, I'm about to sow the biggest seed I've ever sown. And he said, uh, God just told me to give you my airplane. And at that time, it was worth a quarter of a million dollars. I sold a thousand dollars out of my aviation account and reaped a quarter of a million dollar airplane. Now, if you remember... Genesis chapter 26, where Isaac sowed in famine. And remember, he reaped a hundredfold in the same year. In the same year. This is October. The second week, I've already reaped an airplane worth over a quarter of a million dollars. The next night in that same meeting, some people from Canada who were not in that meeting in Charlotte walked up to me and said, before we left Canada, God told us to bring you this for your television ministry and handed me a check for $100,000. A thousand I sowed, a hundred thousand I reaped. And it went on and on and on. And by the December the 31st of 1981, I had reaped a hundred times on every seed I'd sowed. Why is that? I was in a flow. I said I was in a flow. You know, sometimes when you're in your worst circumstances, God will tell you to do something beyond your reasoning and it'll put you in a flow. It'll put you in a flow. Amen. Sometimes when you think I can't afford to give, God will tell you to give. And if you're obedient, it'll put you in a flow. It'll break a barrier. Is anybody listening to me this morning? I want to be in the flow. How about you? Brother Roberts used to say this about uh, 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 the blessing of a tither. He said, when when God opens the windows of heaven and pours out blessing upon you, it won't be in a trickle. It won't be in a stream. It won't be in a river. It'll be a flood. Hallelujah. Look at somebody say, I want in flood stage. Come on, give the Lord a shout. Praise God. Amen. So once again, the Passion Translation says uh, for James 1.17 that gifts, perfect good and perfect gifts will come streaming down from the Father, meaning flowing out in abundance. Hallelujah. Showers of blessing. One, one commentary for Ezekiel 34, 26 says this, when it talks about showers of blessings, a liberal distribution, a liberal distribution and liberal being defined as generous 
ample, bountiful, extensive, profuse, and still another meaning is unrestricted. Amen. Look at your neighbor and say, that's the, li- that's the kind of life I want to live. Look at your neighbor and say, I want in the flow, praise God. Amen. You still here? Hallelujah. Now, once again, God wants all of his people to experience all of his blessings. He's no respecter of persons. But there is a part that you and I play. Now let's go to Proverbs chapter 28. Proverbs chapter 28. A faithful man shall abound with blessings. A faithful man shall abound with blessings. Sounds like to me we have just come up on a prerequisite. A faithful man or woman shall abound with blessings. Abound sounds like get in a flow. They shall abound with blessings. Now, the question I have for you is, do you consider yourself faithful? See, the, 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 the supreme test is not you asking yourself if you are faithful. It's do like David and ask God. Am I faithful? He will tell you the truth. You may lie to yourself. Let me try on this side of the auditorium. (laughs) Ask God if you're faithful. He'll tell you the truth. Now, people have uh, different opinions about faithfulness, different ideas about faithfulness, different definitions of faithfulness. I've had people say, Brother Jerry, I've been coming to church now for a month. Am I faithful? Not Not yet. Anybody can do something for a month. Well, most anybody. Uh, I, I've, been, I've been sowing in the church for about three weeks now. Am I faithful? Not yet. Three weeks does not determine faithfulness. Uh, consider this. Carol and I just celebrated 56 years of marriage. And there's never been another woman in my life. I call that faithful. You mean I got to do something for 56 years? (laughs) See, I lost you already. No, faithfulness is something you determine and you stick with it. In the good times and in the bad times. Now, a lot of people are no longer faithful when adversity comes. They start blaming God. You know, why did God let this happen to me? And then they stop coming to church. They stop giving. You know, I remember uh, uh, a man that that I met in liberal Kansas years ago, back in the early 70s. And uh, they told me that he was the meanest man in liberal Kansas. He, he he, he, He was a drunk and he fought all the time. He, he'd just look at you and just, just bust you in the mouth. And, and he got saved through in a full gospel businessmen's meeting. And he came to my meetings uh, when I started going to liberal. And I'd go there about, oh, maybe twice a year back in those early days. And he'd come to my meetings and he'd get hold of the word of faith. And boy, you, I mean, this guy changed big time. Changed big time. I mean, he, he fell in love with the word of God and, and, uh, and I remember him calling me one day and he was crying. He said, Brother Jerry, it's not working. I'm doing everything you told me to do and it's not working. You sent me those Kenneth Copeland tapes and Kenneth Hagin tapes and I'm doing everything they said and it's not working. Just, you know, crying. And I called him by his name. I said, they told me before you got saved, you was the baddest man in liberal Kansas. Sounds like to me, I'm talking to a wimp. I was glad I was in Fort Worth and he was in liberal. 
<laughs> on the phone. You know? He said, what? I said, you're a wimp. You're not bad. You're a wimp. I hung up on him. He called me back and said, you calling me a wimp? I said, what are you crying about? He said, I told you I'm doing everything you told me to do and it's not working. I said, you're a wimp. And I hung up on him again. He called me back. I was waiting for his call. See, I'm provoking him to faith. Amen. 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 First, I had to provoke him to anger, you know. (laughs) And he called me back and he said, I'll tell you one thing, Jerry Savelle, I am not a wimp. Then he started preaching to me. Man, he went to quoting scripture and he said, I'll tell you one thing, I'm not a quitter. I'm not a wimp. I'm not going to let the devil beat me and I'm going to come out on top. You understand me? See, what I was endeavoring to do worked. Amen. See, a lot of people, they're faithful until there's a crisis. But then on the other hand, there are people that are faithful until they don't need God anymore. They're making things happen themselves. See, the Bible uh, says, and I'm paraphrasing, that one of the greatest sins of Israel was they didn't continue to seek God when they had abundance. They didn't keep uh, uh, serving him with, with gladness and joy, the Bible says, when they were experiencing abundance. See, when you have all you need, that's another setup from the devil. Or if you don't have anything that you need, that's another setup from the devil. So it goes from one end of the spectrum to the other. So the ideal situation is just stay faithful. Good or bad. Yes. Amen. Amen. You know, should I say this? Yes, say she said I should. Okay, so I, I will. If this church still had all the people that have told us, this is my church, this is where God sent me, and I'm with you, brother. If they were all still here, the Fort Worth Convention Center wouldn't hold them all. Where are they? Some. Because adversity. Or some. Because everything's going well and they don't need us anymore. Just stay faithful. And really, that's true about every church in America. I mean, not just this church. I I, I go to churches, and many churches, they have received me as as an apostolic authority to the church, and I go there consistently, some every year, some more than once a year. And I always go looking to see if the same people are there that were there the last time I was there. And, and it always blesses me when the same driver picks me up for 20 years. Yes. Yeah. I said, you're still here. Yes. He said, oh yeah, I'm still here. I said, you're one of the rare ones. The Bible says, a faithful man, who can find? When the Bible has to ask that question, where do you find faithful people? Then apparently it's a serious problem in the body of Christ. Moving right along. Since you're enjoying this so much, hallelujah. Amen. A faithful man shall abound with blessings. A faithful man gets in the flow. A faithful man will get in the flow. Abound means that the blessings will be in great abundance and prevalent. Not only you will know it, but others will know it. Your faithfulness is visible. Others can see it. Amen. Amen. Now the Passion Translation says, life's blessings drench the honest and faithful person. Life's blessings drench the honest and faithful 
person. Drench means to cover, submerge, and permeate. And permeate implies freely flowing. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So life's blessings will freely flow in the life of a faithful person. I could have been a lawyer. I rest my case. Amen. Faithfulness. Faithfulness. Hallelujah. Now, faithfulness to God and to his word is how we get into the flow. Can you say amen? amen. And I'm, I'm basing that on what we've just read from the scripture. Okay. Now, one of my favorite scriptures, especially in this season of my life, I'm about to turn 76 years old. I'm getting older. And one of my favorite scriptures is found in Psalm 92, verse 12 through 14. I'm reading it from the Amplified. And I want you to notice, the reason I'm reading it from the Amplified is a key word. The uncompromisingly righteous. The uncompromisingly righteous shall flourish like the palm tree. Be long-lived, stately, upright, useful, fruitful. They shall grow like a cedar in Lebanon. Majestic, stable, durable, incorruptible. Go on to the next verse. Planted in the house of the Lord, they shall flourish in the courts of our God. Next verse. Growing in grace, they shall still bring forth fruit in old age. In old age. In old age. And all the old age people in the auditorium said, Amen. Amen. <laughs> they shall be full of sap. All the old people say, I'm full of sap. <laughs> they shall be full of sap of spiritual vitality and rich in the verdure of trust, love, and contentment. Okay? So notice, even in old age, they shall still flourish. Yes. They shall still bear fruit. Yes. Why? They, they, if they started out being faithful, and in old age they're still faithful, God is still rewarding their faithfulness. I said, I don't mind getting older. The only part about getting older is my thin, my skin is thin. I don't like that. I bruise easy. Are there any others in here who experience that? I hate that. I, I can bump something and don't even realize I've done it and look down and I got a bruise on my hand. Look at that. I got it covered with makeup, but that, that's, that's bruising. Look at this. It's thin. <laughs> That's the only part about getting older I don't like. I, I saw this in my dad and I saw it in Carolyn's dad. And, and I don't even know when I do something and I look down and I got, if I took my shirt off, which I'm not gonna do cause you'd be envious. <laughs> You'd be envious of this 76 year old man <laughs> with no gut. Amen. <laughs> I got bruises all down my arm. I can hardly wear a short sleeve shirt. It's so visible. And I don't know where I did it. I don't know when I did it. I don't know if Carolyn is hitting me in my sleep. <laughs> How did I, I didn't have that bruise when I went to bed. How did I get a bruise in, the, in my sleep? <laughs> That's the only part I don't like about getting older. But on the other hand, I look forward to getting older because God promises that I will still flourish. I'll still bring forth fruit and I'll still be in the flow. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God is so good. Amen? Amen. Praise God. Amen. The Passion Translation says they are thriving and they will still overflow. They will be thriving and they will still overflow. Notice flourish, thriving, and overflowing. 
God wants you to still be in the flow of his blessing, even when you grow old. Amen. Amen. Now, let me ask you this question. Just how much of the flow of God's blessings do you want in your life? Just how much of the flow of God's blessings do you want in your life? Ezekiel described a flowing river in Ezekiel 47, verses 1 through 5, that you could get into up to your ankles, or you could get into it up to your knees, or you could get into it up to your loins, or you could get into it even at a level that was over your head. Now, if you got a choice, why would you want to stay ankle deep? If you got a choice, why would you even want to just stay at knee deep? If you got a choice, why would you want to just stay at loin deep? I don't know about you, but I want in over my head. Hallelujah. I want in all the way. I want everything God has for me. Hallelujah. Oh, now, Brother Jerry, that's greed. No, it's not greed. It's faith. I'm just acting on what he said. If, you've heard me say this many times in the past. If God didn't intend to bring to pass something he said in his word, he shouldn't have put it in my copy of the Bible. Because once I find it, I'm going for it. Amen. 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 Is anybody else that way? So tell somebody, why don't you just go jump in the river? <laughs> And, and jump in and get over your head, praise God. Amen. As I, was, as I was writing these notes, I thought of a song that was very, very popular. And, and I hear it occasionally, not nearly as much as I did back in the late 70s and early 80s. And it was written by a gentleman by the name of David Sapp. And David... <laughs> David in the building? David traveled with me in my meetings for a season and he would sing this quite often in our meetings. And it was called, There is a River. Anybody remember that song? See if I can remember the lines. There is a river that flows from God above. There is a river. Now, there is a fountain that's filled with his great love. Come to the water. There is a vast supply. There is a river that never shall run dry. Hey. That's, that's what I thought of when I read that in Ezekiel about this flowing river. Sing it with me. There is a river that flows from God above. There is a river. No, back up. There is a fountain. There is a fountain that's filled with his great love. Come to the water. There is a vast supply. There is a river that never shall run dry. So tell somebody again, go jump in the river. Amen. Amen. All right, you're still here. Praise God. Just having a little fun with you this morning. All right. The Apostle Paul... said in 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 12. And I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who hath enabled me for that he counted me faithful. He counted me faithful. Counted is defined as deemed, considered, or judged. And judged is defined as determined and pronounced. So Paul is saying, God took a survey of my life and discovered and pronounced that I was faithful. Amen. Amen. If God was to investigate your life today, would he deem you faithful? My question to you once again is, has God determined and pronounced you faithful? It's one of the key factors 
as to how to get into the flow of God's blessings. Flow implies uninterrupted, continuous, and never ending. Get in the flow. Get in the flow. Determine no matter what happens that you will remain faithful. Amen. Amen. Faithfulness is a virtue that the world does not value today. But God does. Most people today are not interested in being faithful. Most people are sporadic. Uh, They're seasonal. But if you want to get in the flow of God's blessings, then faithfulness is the major key. And once again, faithfulness is not measured over a short period of time. It's measured over a long duration. Amen. Faithful to the end. Hallelujah. And that's what I call the rewards of faithfulness is what I call living life in its fullness. James chapter 1 verse 22. But be ye doers of the word and not hearers only deceiving your own selves. Now, we read Deuteronomy chapter 28 at the beginning and it talked about obeying God's word. Some people today say, some preachers today say, uh, that's, that's Old Testament. We're not required to do that anymore. Well, the last time I checked, James was in the New Testament. Did you notice that? Be ye doers of the word and not hearers only deceiving your own selves. In other words, if you're not being a doer of the word, you're deceived. Some people today teaching on grace, and I love grace, but some people teach that under the New Testament, we can live our lives any way we want to because God's already taken care of everything. That's deceived. We're required to be doers of the word in the New Testament as well. Now the Amplified Bible says, obey the message and not merely listeners to it. And the message translation says, act on what you hear. Act on what you hear. Did you know, since you're in here this morning and you're hearing what I'm saying, you're responsible to act on it now? I didn't find anybody in here had their hands over the ears the whole sermon. (laughs) So, like somebody said one time, I'd hate to be responsible for all that. Once I share it, you are. (laughs) Once Pastor Justin shares it, you are. You heard it. Amen. Amen. Aren't you glad you came this morning? (laughs) So be ye doers of the word. And this is not implying occasionally or one time. It's consistently. Consistently be a doer of the word. And verse 22, 3 says, or 25 says, and a doer shall be blessed in his deeds. So notice the doing of the word. Consistent doing the word. Consistently acting on the word. Living by the principles of God's word. Consistently you will be blessed in your deed. So once again, consistency is a key factor in entering into the flow. Amen. Amen. Everyone would like to get into the flow because it sure sounds good, but not everybody will get in the flow. And the reason being simply this, they aren't faithful. They aren't faithful. And you know why most people are not faithful? It requires discipline. And discipline is a ugly word to most Christians. <laughs> discipline. Discipline. It, it, it requires discipline to be faithful. Getting in the flow of God's blessings is directly linked to how faithful you are to incorporate God's principles for living into your lifestyle. I'll say it again. Getting into the flow of God's blessings is directly linked 
to how faithful you are to incorporate God's principles for living into your lifestyle. Being determined to become more and more faithful results in enjoying more and more of the blessings. Once while Jesus was sharing a parable with his disciples, he told them about faithful servants and what the master said to them in Matthew chapter 25, verse 21. Well done, thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. The Passion Translation says, you have proven yourself to be my loyal and trustworthy servant. Because you've been faithful, I will put you in charge of much more. Another way of saying it is, I will entrust you with more and more. I call that getting in the flow, getting into the flow. So let me ask you this question. Has anyone besides yourself ever noticed your faithfulness? See, the Bible says in Proverbs, most men will say I'm faithful. But a faithful man who can find, it goes on to say. So most men will, will brag on themselves about being faithful. But has anybody else noticed it? In 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 8, talking to the believers in Thessalonica, Paul says, In every place your faith to Godward is spread abroad. The Amplified Bible says, Everywhere the report has gone forth of your faith in God. There are other translations that use the word faithfulness instead of faith, which would read, In every place your faithfulness to God is spread abroad. In other words, people in other parts of that region were hearing about not only their faith in God, but their faithfulness to God. They were hearing about it. Somebody else should notice your faithfulness. Not only your faith in God, but your faithfulness to God. The message translation adds this. Your lives are echoing the master's word all over the place. Amen. It's echoing the word. In other words, you are living out what you've seen in the word and people are noticing it. The evidence of your faithfulness to God and his word will stand out to others. And because of this, Paul went on to say to the Christians in Thessalonica in chapter three, verse three in the Amplified, the Lord is faithful and he will strengthen you and set you on a firm foundation and guard you from the evil one. The message translation says, the master will never let you down. He'll stick by you and protect you. And I wrote in my notes, in other words, Satan will not be able to stop the flow of God's blessing in your life. Amen. 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 He will not be able to stop the flow of God's blessings in your life. What a way to live. Amen. So faithfulness, my definition, is to become unwavering, uncompromising, uh, resolute regarding what God has said and how God expects us to live. When you've determined that this is how you will live, then get ready because the blessings will flow. Yes. Can you say amen? amen? Let me wrap it up with this. It's only 1115. You got your sermon ready, Justin? <laughs> Hey, I'm becoming like Jesus. I can say more in 15 minutes than. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Uh, Proverbs 28, which we read earlier, from the New International Version A faithful person will be richly blessed. Amen. Why? They've got in the flow because of their faithfulness. As I mentioned earlier, faithfulness for many people is not a virtue that is important or valued, but it certainly is valued by God and it always gets his attention. It's one thing to believe in God, but it's another thing to be faithful to God. Faithfulness in a general sense is the same as being loyal, steadfast, and trustworthy. Faithfulness requires us to move beyond ourselves 
and to put the will of God first place in our lives. We need to make a fresh commitment, probably every day, a fresh commitment in our everyday life that we will strive to be more reliable to God and be more reliable to his word. The greatest example of faithfulness is in the life and ministry of Jesus himself. Even when he was about to be taken to the cross and be crucified, in Luke chapter 22, verse 42, he makes this statement. Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine will be done. That's true faithfulness. The life of faithfulness is not always an easy life, but it is a rewarding life. The psalmist was once wrote, speaking of God in Proverbs 18, 25 from the New International Version, to the faithful, you show yourself faithful. To the faithful, God will show himself faithful. He will cause them to experience the fulfillment of every promise he has made to them. Once again, the real test of faithfulness is what you will do and how you respond when adversity comes. 2 Timothy 3.12 from the Amplified Bible. Indeed, all who are, pre, are, are determined to live a devoted life in Christ will meet adversity. Now, that's not one of our favorite verses, but it's true. See, are you a word person or a favorite word person? <laughs> we pick and choose, but the Bible says, indeed, all who are determined to live a devoted life in Christ will meet adversity. In the world, you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I've overcome the world. But nevertheless, as long as you're in this world, you will be first faced with adversity. But that doesn't mean you have to give up and quit. Jesus has conquered it for you. Like, like the, the man that came to me, at, I was preaching with Oral Roberts at, in the Maybe Center a number of years ago. And Brother Roberts said, now, I'm going to preach first and you close it out. And then you pray for the people. And we had several thousand people in the Maybe Center there. And so Brother Roberts finished his sermon, turned it over to me. And then at the end, I began praying for people. And I had, uh, it seemed like 200 people in that prayer line. There was thousands in the building. And uh, I got up to a man that I knew. And he said, Brother Jerry, I want you to pray for me that I will never have another problem as long as I live. I will never go through any more adversity as long as I live. I said, okay. So I laid my hands on him and said, Lord, let this man die. He said, I don't want to die. I said, well, sir, that's what you asked me to pray. He said, no, I ask you to pray that I'll never have any more adversity. I said, well, sir, the only way I know that you will never have any more adversity, you have to die and leave the planet. He said, I don't want to die. I said, Lord, let him live. <laughs> and teach him how to be strong in adversity. Has anybody in here never gone through adversity? If you lift your hand, I'm going to cast out a lying devil. <laughs> I've gone through adversity. I don't know anybody that hasn't gone through adversity. You're in the world. You will have tribulation or adversity, but you don't have to give in to it. You don't have to give up. You can stay in faith. And God will make a winner out of you, praise God. He'll come through for you. Can you say amen? amen? So once again, Paul is telling Timothy and all of us as well, all who are determined to live a devoted life in Christ, or you could say all who are determined to be faithful will meet with adversity. What is Paul saying? Don't be surprised when you are persecuted. Don't be surprised when you come under attack. Don't be surprised when trouble comes your way. It's going to happen. But then he says in verse 14, continue to hold to the things that you have learned and of which you have been convinced of. In other words, don't change a thing. Just remain faithful, remain committed, and God will see you through. Amen. And then in verse 11, Paul gives his own personal testimony of this. 
He said, persecutions, tribulations, sufferings in Antioch and, and so forth. I endured, but out of them all, the Lord delivered me. And what is he saying? He delivered me because I stood in faith. I endured and he'll deliver you. Praise God. So once again, to the faithful, God will be faithful. So remain faithful to God no matter what. And God will see to it that you get in the flow of his blessings. And praise God, the older you get, the better they come. Hallelujah. The more they come. Hallelujah. Praise God. Come on, give the Lord a great shout of praise. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Stand to your feet, if you will. Glory to God. May some of you be, uh, may be some of you in here today that you're going through adversity. Let me say this to you. I've had people say, what am I doing wrong? Because I'm under attack. It's not always something you're doing wrong. Sometimes it's because you're doing something right. So uh, let me just leave this with you as you get ready to go. There's only two times that Satan attacks you. When you've done something wrong, when you've done something right. Other than that, he'll leave you alone. <laughs> Amen. Look at somebody and say, well, I believe I'm doing something right. Amen. Now, if you're doing something wrong, correct it. Amen. Correct it. Repent. Amen. But if you know you're doing what God's word says, then just continue in what you have believed. In other words, Paul is saying, don't change a thing. Just stay committed, stay faithful, and God will deliver you just like he delivered me. Amen. Amen. Let's lift our hands and rejoice in the Lord. Praise God. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father, for your goodness. Thank you for your mercy. And thank you, Lord, for enabling us as we are committed to be faithful to your word, to experience the flow of your blessings. Lord, I pray that not one person who heard me this morning, both in this auditorium and those watching by live stream, not one of them allowed this word, this message, to just go in one ear and out the other, that they'll take it to heart. You want them blessed. You, you, you sent Jesus to die on the cross, be raised from the dead so that we could be blessed. And all you ask us to do is just remain faithful. Stay committed to you. Stay committed to your word. We can do that. Everybody say, I can do that. I can do that. It's just a matter of you making a decision. Or as Brother Copeland used to say, a quality decision. And don't back off. Don't turn back. Stay faithful. In the good times and in the bad times. And God will cause you to get into the flow. Hallelujah. Get in the flow. Just like that river. Hallelujah. Every once in a while when you're feeling down, go stand on the shores of a river and watch it flow. And say, hey, I'm in the flow. I'm in the flow, praise God. Blessings are coming my way. When I'm coming in, when I'm going out, when I'm in the city, when I'm in the field, blessings hunt me down. Come on me, overtake me, and surprise me because I'm in the flow. Hallelujah. Give the Lord one more 